Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 152. Improving Teen Communication. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my communicative and attentive co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. How about you? Well, I'm doing okay. We are finally back in the studio to record. We tried last week, and we had some utility issues. Yep. Uh, going through a heat wave last week and uh, could not keep the power on around here long enough to get a, get a podcast on. Yeah. Anything else exciting going on with you? Um, I get, um, we're progressing in band. That's good. Progression's important. I didn't go yesterday because I wasn't feeling too well. So then you didn't progress this week. Well, I progressed we were we're just starting to progress, but I could I had to miss yesterday. Well, that's unfortunate. I hope you're feeling better. Yeah, I'm better. That's good. That's all that matters. Yep. So today we're talking communication. <clears throat> communication is the cornerstone to any successful relationship, whether it's between a parent and a child, spouses, fellow students, teachers, or even in the workplace. The ability to communicate willingly. And effectively, oftentimes, is the difference between success and failure at many levels. This podcast is a shining example of a method and desire to communicate, but there are many other less elaborate methods as well. On today's episode of Insights into Teens, we'll discuss these methods and much more to hopefully help our audience become better communicators. But before we do do that, I would like to invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast, you can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights in the Teens. Audio and video versions of all of our podcasts can be found listed as Insights in the Things on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, etc. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe. Uh, no, I already invited you to subscribe. Yep. I'm going to invite you to give us your feedback and tell us how we're doing. Uh, we're also always looking for suggestions for topics to discuss on the show. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com, where you can find links to all of our social media sites, accounts, contacts. Yes, I guess that's what they are, contacts. Yeah. You can find links to all that on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready? I guess we are. Hopefully I flubbed enough already. We can get through the rest of this. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. So what is healthy communication? This actually comes to us from PlannedParenthood.org. They say healthy communication skills can turn a good relationship into a great one. Healthy communication is all about respect, honesty, listening, and being open with your feelings and what you want. Communication isn't all about talking. Listening and being respectful are just as important. Healthy communication is a two-way street. It's easy to talk about things when times are good or when both people see eye to eye. But in a healthy relationship, you can talk about the difficult stuff without insulting or hurting each other. You might not always agree, but you talk through your differences while feeling safe, respected, and heard. That means telling someone that you want and feel and what you want and feel and also listening and respecting what they say as well. Healthy communication is not manipulative, mean-spirited, disrespectful, or one-sided. It's not about getting your way. It's about both of you being there for each other. 
So why is it important for parents to communicate with their kids? And this comes to us from aces.edu. They say as a teen gets older, they will spend more time away from their parents and family. They will need to make decisions on their own and will be expected by others to take responsibility for their actions. Although teens are gaining more independence from their parents, they are not experienced and need continuing and need continual parental guidance. Being sensitive to your teen's levels of maturity when offering guidance helps in building greater self-confidence in them. When you communicate sensitively with your teens, you are helping them in a number of ways to grow up to be responsible adults. You are helping your teen understand that family rules change as they get older. When Jack turned 16 and received his driver's license, he wanted to use the family car for, the, for weekend activities. He and his mom discussed the rules for using the car and how car privileges will depend upon Jack showing responsibility. He is expected to fill the car with gas before bringing it home, and he needs to have it home by at the time promised. Setting up these rules in advance helps Jack to know what is expected of him when he uses the car. Knowing the rules also helps him to accept the consequences if he falls short of obeying the rules. You're also helping your teens to have better self-esteem. Tim compares himself often to other kids at school. He frequently feels like a failure since he does not do as well on tests as others in his second string on the basketball team. Tim's dad has listened to his son complain about not being as good as other kids and has expressed understanding of his feelings. This usually helps Tim feel better. Dad has been taking more time with Tim to do activities they both enjoy. He makes a special effort to make comments about things that Tim does well. He's also helping Tim to appreciate his own strengths and abilities. You're also offering your teen good role modeling in solving problems with other people. I need the name again. Erin? Erin and her mom are out... It's a nice Irish name. (laughs) I am sorry. (laughs) Erin and her mom are out shopping one day when a salesperson is rude to them as they try to return some clothes. Mom calmly tells the salesperson that she expected to be permitted to return the items and asks if a manager is present who can assist with the return. The salesperson responds in a more helpful fashion. Erin later asks Mom why she did not get angry at the salesperson. Mom replies, I was angry, but I have learned that I get better results when I stay calm and think about the best way to get the response I want. Through the experience, Aaron had the opportunity to observe and discuss a good way to handle problems with other people. You're also helping your teen to make important life decisions. Henry's trying to decide on college. He wants to pick the best one, but he's not sure how to do this. His parents talk to him about his future goals, about the colleges that have programs that interest him, and about colleges that the family can afford. They suggest that Henry call some of the colleges and arrange to visit the ones that are on the top of his list. They talk with Henry about other steps he can take to narrow his choices. His parents help him to figure out how to make good decisions, thus they permit him to take the steps needed to make a good choice. So, I I guess my first question to you is, how do you think we communicate here as a family? Well, like you said in the beginning, the podcast is a really big communicative factor for both you and me. Um, we're, in that, we're able to discuss teen problems or just aspects of being a teen since it is so complex. In while well, we have the research for it and we have you know, the one-on-one conversations with each other about these issues. You ask my personal take on them and how we do as a family with certain topics. And I definitely find this is a very good way for both of us to communicate with each other. We both learn different aspects about each other through this and thus we communicate a lot better because... We have this openness between us in the podcast, and when we are able to talk about 
the various topics that we've discussed on here, um, it definitely helps. It's like, it's a really good way for us to have talks with also having the research behind it to have the talks. So both of us know what we're talking about and can both express how we feel about it. How about with mommy? I mean, do you have these talks with mommy? Do you have one-on-ones with mommy? Do, do the three of us together have talks? Like, how, how do we as a family interact? I, you know, I, I can't, I certainly can't criticize what we do from a podcast standpoint, communication, but outside of that, how do you think we do? Well, I definitely have a lot of one-on-one time with mommy whenever she's um, home working and I'm at home because I'm not doing anything. Um, during lunchtime, we tend to have one-on-one conversations about either something we heard in the news, just something that interests both of us, or just something that I wanted to bring up and, t- and discuss with her. And then for um, us as a family, a lot of the times for communication, we tend to have our dinner. And at dinner, we tend to talk about our... We do tend to have dinner, yeah. (laughs) Group family dinner, whatever we used to call it on here. I don't remember what we originally called it, but basically it's just like all of us would gather around for dinner at the table, and then we'd talk about how our days went, and then we'd have discussions from then, and like take conversation points, bring up them, and... You know, we would definitely, that's definitely a big uh, communicative factor that um, I feel we as a family uh, all participate in. And I would tend to agree. I think we communicate pretty well here. And Mommy and I certainly communicate pretty well. And I can't speak for, for anyone else. I can only speak for myself. But I became an effective communicator through failure, really. The, you know, the times that I've been able to improve my ability to communicate have been the direct result of miscommunications. So it's one of those things where you kind of have to do it. You have to exercise that skill in order to polish it. You know, it's like kind of like a diamond. You know, you, you get a, a diamond, and if that diamond, you know, you in order to make that diamond beautiful, you have to work the diamond. You have to cut it, you have to polish it, and so forth. And... Communication skills are kind of the same thing. You have to polish your communication skills. And I've made a number of mistakes over the years. Um, I think just of, you know, some of the complications with my relationship with Sam, where a lot of the reasons that we had issues, it was communication issues on my part. Um, and I've learned from those mistakes. He and I have a much better relationship. We communicate much better now than we used to. And I use those skills that I learned to have a better relationship with you moving forward. So you kind of get the benefit from the mistakes that I made earlier on. I guess so. So, um, I think that's all we had on this topic. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Um, I was going to like quickly throw in something. I might have yeah, saved it for ahead. the end, but... Um, I kind of want to say, kind of bring up the fact that we are social creatures. Us as a human species have been known to socialize, and thus communication is kind of something that almost everybody needs to deal with. Even if you're the most introverted person that doesn't like going outside and is not very good with talking to people, you kind of still need communication in some way. There's always some sort of social benefactor that goes along with it because there is always somebody really socialized with. And as much as people are introverted a lot now, they still socialize with people and kind of need social interaction. Yeah. I mean, I can't argue with that. I don't think anybody can argue with the fact that human beings are social creatures. There are those of us who are less social than others, Yeah, but you know, if you're going to be a part, a contributing member of society, let's say, you need to be able to communicate either with your family, with coworkers, with people at school. It's a skill that you need to have. And those that struggle with it tend to kind of arrest their own development. Like in order to excel in a social environment like ours, you have to be able to communicate. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about issues that can affect 
communication in teenagers. We'll be right back. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights in the Teens. Today we're talking about improving teen communication. And now we're going to talk about the issues that can affect communication in teenagers. And this comes to us from Better Health, and I'm not going to add the tag on because it's way too complicated. <laughs> anyway, adolescence is a time of rapid change, not just for the young person, but for the parents too. It might be hard to let go sometimes, but parents need to recognize that a child's job is to grow and become an, an independent adult. As a parent, you need to help young people through this process. Decisions can now be made together. Try to discuss issues to reach an outcome that you and your teenager can both accept. Young people have viewpoints that are different from yours or may take up activities that you don't understand. Try to see this as a good thing. They are learning to be their own person. You will always feel responsible for your child's well-being and safety no matter how old they are. When children reach their teenage years, they start to make their own decisions. Sometimes they make the wrong ones. Try to support and not criticize. They will, hopefully, learn valuable lessons from their mistakes. During this time of constant change, both parents and young people need to take time to care for themselves. You need to show your... You va you need to show you value your teenager and their uniqueness. Show them your unconditional love. The effects of negative communication can have significant impact on teens. Conflict is inevitable when people with different views live together, so the occasional class with your teenager is normal and to be expected. However, ongoing conflict can undermine the relationship between a parent and a young person. Negative communication is a common cause for chronic conflict. Examples of negative communications include nagging, harsh criticism, or standover tactics such as yelling to force your compliance. It's not always easy to recognize negative communication. For example, well-meaning parents may criticize because they want their child to try harder. You are a negative you're, you're using negative communications if your conversation rapidly deteriorates into nagging, yelling, or fighting, you feel angry, upset, rejected, blamed, or unloved, or the issue under dispute doesn't ever improve. Turning negatives into positives. You can change negative communication into positive communication. Suggestions include negotiate how to communicate with each other. Work out strategies to improve your communication. Brainstorm solutions together. Select what is important to argue over. A basic guideline is that safety issues, like not getting in a, into a car with a driver who has been drinking, are always, are always worth fighting over. Other things, like cleaning up the messy bedroom, might be best to ignore. Just keep the door shut. Offer constructive criticism. Acknowledge and celebrate their achievements. They will know themselves when they have got it wrong and don't need to be reminded by you. And finally, set a good example by apologizing when you're wrong. So do you think we have a positive or negative level of communication? I 
I'd say it's a pretty positive amount. Most of the time you guys aren't nagging me about anything, and we never really yell at each other, or whenever there is yelling, you guys are normally just yelling at me, and I never really yell back. We really yell at you, then. But, yeah, like I said, that rarely happens anyway, but when it does, very rarely, you guys are the only ones yelling. And who does the nagging around? You can be honest. Uh... Mm. Is it me or is it mommy? Uh, mm. uh, Your parents were a little <laughs> rag. Um, depends on the day, I guess. Uh, see, and I would have thought I would have nagged more than mommy did. I mean, yeah, you're technically more of the nagger. Yeah. Well, I'm the type of person that I, I, I tend to needle. You know, when you do something consistently wrong over and over, you know, like I ask you to do something and you don't do it. And then I ask you to do it again and you don't do it. And then I ask you to do it again and you don't do it. At that point in time, it's not nagging, it's needling at that point in time. Now at that point in time, I'm kind of rubbing your nose in. I mean, mommy also does that, so. Good. Does it help? Do you eventually do what you're supposed to do? Kind of. Most of the time. Okay, so that kind <laughs> of helps. Most of the time. How do you think you are? Do you think you're a positive or a negative communicator? I'd say I try to be as positive as I can. I don't always, like, try nagging you guys about stuff, and I don't always try to get my way by screaming. So I think you're pretty passive in what you communicate, typically. Yeah, it's like, whenever I ask for something, even if I'm paying for it, it's like... Hi, can I ask you something? I think you could serve your own self-interest if you were more assertive, let's say. Because I think you're, you tend to be a little too timid when you communicate. Because it's important for other people to know what what it is that you want, what you're looking for. You know, you're going to need to be able to communicate that in friendships and relationships later on with people you work with and roommates and stuff like that. If they don't know or you're not getting across what you want and, and the direction that you want to go, it's not other people's fault if they impede your intentions. How about the negativity here? When we do have negativity, how do we deal with it? Uh, most of the time we would take time away from each other. We would go back. We would kind of... The few times I have gotten upset at mommy normally when I'm not feeling well or when she's not feeling well, we'll normally spend some time apart just going back to our own little world for a bit until we're calm enough to talk to each other. How about outside forces? Do you, do you find that you communicate well with people outside the household? Probably. I communicate uh, decently with the friends I have and... I try to be a decent communicator with most people. Most of the time, I just... I'm not good with strangers. I can definitely tell that. I'm not, like, the eccentric extrovert that my mom is. Um, I have issue talking with, like, people I've never met or just being in contact with people I've never met. Um, especially if they're outwardly extroverted towards me or, like, ask me something. I have... I, like, get nervous and can't really communicate. Um, but I'd say with my friends, I'm a decent communicator. I've definitely gotten better, like how you did, um, with, like, learning from your mistakes and being a better communicator. I definitely did that. I used to ha I used to get into fights a lot with one of my friends, and most of the time it was me not really be being able to handle my emotions a lot, and it would really just be over not really important stuff. So, I eventually learned to control my emotions, and better communicate with my friends so that we don't fight. Well, that makes sense. And, and you know, with my job and, and having to supervise four, soon to be five people, communication is kind of important. Not only do I have to communicate with my team, but I have to communicate with the management. I have to communicate with the other employees that are our customers. I have to communicate with vendors. And... The, the one example that we speak of earlier where the mom wants to return something and, and she does it in a calm way and gets the reaction she wants, 
Communication does that. Communication can instantly set the mood. You know, you can very easily say something or say something in a certain way. Well, really, one of the communications that's difficult to do is via email. You can't convey emotions through email. Yeah, that's the same way with text messages. I ended up having a conversation with my one friend, and we have so many times where what I say isn't how I really meant to say it. And it's like, it's really difficult to communicate that way. Like, you can say or react to something, but it's not as authentic as actually doing it in person. Right. And, And see, the thing with me, a lot of what I say, I joke around a lot. I'm very sarcastic. And none of that can come through in, in an email. Yeah, absolutely so not. When I write emails, I, I'm very particular to write emails in a very clinical and a very professional way where I don't try to convey emotions. I try simply to convey facts in my emails. That way they can't be misconstrued. Yeah. Um, as a result of that, I can't draw on the communication abilities that I've developed. You know, I'll crack self-deprecating jokes to break the ice. Or I'll say something sarcastic to get a rise out of someone. You know, something like that where you play off the audience. And you can't play off the audience in an email. I know. I've tried. That's where (laughs) I've made mistakes in the past. Yep. And you, you come across like completely... Uh, unintended from the way that you originally wanted to. The, and the problem comes in is that when the person on the other side wants to communicate emotions through emails and you misread that, which this has happened at least half a dozen times with the owner of the company with me where he comes across as though he's joking around and I fall into that same cadence of communication and that's not what he was trying to communicate. And now I look like an idiot. So I don't communicate, try to communicate emotions anymore. Uh, but that's not a negative or a positive. It's how it's perceived at that point in time. So I guess the point that I wanted to make is that when we talk about negative communication, negative communication isn't what words you use. It's how the person on the other side, the receiving side of that, perceives what you're saying. Yeah. So a lot of times, that communication, if it's face-to-face, you can read what the other person is feeling. You can read their facial expression, how they're sitting in their chair while you're talking, whether or not they're fidgeting around or playing. You can tell if they're paying attention. When you're verbally communicating with them, you lose a lot of that stuff, but you can still hear intonations in their voice and how they're hearing things and, and perceiving things. By the time you get the text or email or something like that, all, all bets are off at yeah. that point. You know, you're you're kind of in uncharted territory. So you kind of have to know your audience and know your meaning yep. to understand how you're communicating. So we're going to take another quick break as I find my mouse here, my mouse cursor. Um, and we're going to come back and talk about tips for healthy communication. We'll be right back. All righty. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com.
Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we're talking about improving teen communication. And now we're going to talk about tips for healthy communication. Healthy communication takes practice and planning. Here are some tips to help you get started. One of the first tips that I give is to use I statements. Say things like, I feel upset when you, instead of, you're making me upset. Steer clear of blaming or accusing them of purposely trying to hurt you. Be clear and direct. No one can read your mind, so tell them what you think, feel, and need. Don't push aside your feelings. Bring up things that bother you early on so they don't build up and become bigger problems. Build trust. Unless someone has given you a reason not to, believing that they're telling you the truth and assuming that they mean well helps to establish trust. Ask questions. If you don't understand what they're saying or why, ask questions. Don't make assumptions. Talk in person. It is really easy to misunderstand or misinterpret a text message or email like you discussed prior. Talking in person or through a video chat will allow you to hear their tone of voice and see their body language. Don't yell. Unless it's an inanimate object, in which case then I'm off the then, hook. Then right? scream. Uh, getting angry or defensive during an argument is totally normal. But if you're feeling upset or angry, take a break until you both cool off. Kind of like how me and mommy do. Exactly. Be willing to apologize. Everyone makes mistakes. Saying you're sorry, but meaning it, goes a long way in helping to move on after a fight. So before we move on, I did want to ask a couple of things here. All right. So the the I statements. When you're trying to express something to someone, somebody upsets you, somebody says something that, that offends you, are you inclined to use the I statements or do you talk kind of in general terms? I think in a lot of cases of somebody like – is saying something I don't agree with, I'll normally also give my perspective as well and won't, like, try to necessarily blame the person instead of, say, I would normally do, like, the whole I think and, like, I understand your point and this is my perspective, kind of similar to that. I don't try to inherently blame the person for having their own opinion because I know in the long run, even if I feel my... Even if I feel my opinion, well, even I feel if my opinion to me might seem better, people are going to always have differing opinions. And at that point, it's really just, okay, I heard you. I understand your point. I'm just going to give my point so you understand why I don't necessarily agree with you. And that makes sense. And, and some of the issues that I run into when managing a department is you, you try not to single people out. So if somebody does something wrong, it's real easy to just pull them aside and say, hey, look, you screwed up, don't do that, and move on. But there's a benefit that can come from that. And what I try to do when that happens, and this is not a one-on-one -on -one communication thing, it's a group thing. When there's a, a learning moment that can come out of something where someone screws up or does something wrong, I bring it up to the whole group. And because I don't want to embarrass anyone or single anyone out or hurt anyone's feelings, I don't mention what the source was. A lot of times I don't even, I don't even pretend that it comes from the group. You know, I, I talk in as general terms as I can so that the whole group can benefit from it. So, oh, okay, so you're coming in five minutes late from lunch every day and clocking in. Well, here's the problem that we have with that, and, and I go into that and explain it to the whole group so everybody understands why that's not a good thing. And I find that tends to benefit, I tend to get the most benefit from that than if I just corrected the wrong person. So from a one-on-one -on -one standpoint, I try to avoid doing stuff like that. But what about your feelings? Do you, when you have a conversation with someone, do you... Try to push your feelings aside and have more of a logical, unemotional discussion with people, or do you let emotion creep into it? It definitely does depend on how I feel at that point, because 
I do tend to get emotional at certain subjects, but in a lot of cases when I know somebody doesn't agree with what I agree with, I'm also, I choose to be more logical and think, okay, I need to, s it's okay, I understand that they don't have the same opinion, I just need to hear them out, and then I can express my own thoughts. And being a very logical person myself, it's, in a lot of cases, it's easier to think more logically than emotionally. Um, but I definitely, and I've definitely gotten better. Um, like I mentioned before, I did have issues with my friends where I was unable to control my emotions and that really damaged my relationship with my friends. So once I was finally able to get them under control and think more logically about the problems that faced us, um, I ended up starting to better the relationship and I was no longer calling issue getting issues so if somebody doesn't necessarily agree with me or if I'm having a conversation and like there's an emotionally charged subject a lot of the times I'll try to keep myself calm and I really need to stop hitting the mic <laughs> and I'll think of what I can logically do in order to not upset the other person, not have me explode onto them, and just make sure that both of our opinions are out there, and basically just agree to disagree or find common ground. Building trust. So, I'm old, and I'm cynical, and I've been burned a number of times. So trust isn't something that I readily give at this point in time. Everybody, you know, if trust is a scale of 1 to 10, everybody starts at a 1 and can work their way up or down from there with me. If I trust you, I'll have a conversation with you. And then you can earn points from there. How do you deal with trusting people? If someone tells you something or promises you something, how do you trust people? How do you measure trust in people? Um... I guess a lot of it is based on experience, on if I know the person, if I think they'll actually follow through with what they're saying. Um, I give complete strangers kind of what you said. I don't really trust complete strangers unless I get to know them and actually... By well, which case they're not complete strangers. Right? Well, yeah, but like if I get to know somebody and I get to and they start to earn my trust through various ways and also earn my respect at the same time, then I start to trust them more and more. But if they've given me a track record of being dishonest, um, not following through with anything, or, again, not even really knowing them, I, don't I start to lose trust or I don't really have trust to begin with. Okay, that makes sense. Apologizing. Well, apologizing for some people can be the hardest thing to do in the world. And a lot of that has to do with pride yep. and ego. Now, I don't like to apologize because when I apologize, I'm admitting that I did something wrong. And you know as well as I do, I'm near perfect. And I very rarely, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've learned over the years to swallow my pride apologizing, and they, they make a point in this article of saying, you have to mean it. There are a lot of times, and parents do this to their kids, say you're sorry, and the kid says, I'm sorry, and walks away, and the kid doesn't really mean it. Yeah. Apologizing and meaning it means you understand what you did was wrong. And if you don't recognize that you did something and that it was wrong and what the impact was, then apologizing is not going to do anything because you still think you're righteous and you're going to go off and do it again later on. If you're going to apologize, it has to have a lasting effect. It has to change how you conduct yourself in the future. So that's the lesson that I've learned from apologizing is that I can't just say I'm sorry. And I'm not the type of person to offer a snap apology. If I know that I offended someone, I'll reflect on that, and I'll think about what I said or what I did, and I'll think about how it affected you, and I'll try to role-play myself in just about every aspect of that, that transaction. 
that way I can fully appreciate what the impact was. Because I say things, you know, a lot, I, like I said, I joke around a lot, and I'll try to get a laugh to lighten the situation. And sometimes I'll say things that are stupid. And at the time, they just sort of come out of my mouth, and they, before they come out, they don't sound stupid. Yeah. And it's sometimes where it comes out of my mouth, and I almost know once it comes out of my mouth, it's, it's stupid, and I want to pull it back in, but it's too late. Yeah. And I see the impact that it has on people. And the one thing that's done is it's made me think of these things and not just let them fly out of my mouth. So it gives me a little bit of a filter. But when I still do it, and I will, and I, I'll always do it because I'm human I'm, and I'm fallible, more fallible than I think some other people. But, <laughs> but when that happens, I kind of take it almost like a, a meditative research myself to put myself in that person's shoes before I apologize. Because then at that point in time, when I apologize, I'm not just saying, I'm sorry. I'm saying, I'm sorry, I realized what I did was wrong, and I'm going to try not to do that again in the future. It's not just I'm sorry. So, are you someone who can apologize? And when you do, is it a meaningful apology? And do you have any examples of it? I definitely have at least two examples of me apologizing, but I also do want to share a quick example, um, similar, it's not really me apologizing, but it's an example of when I have to admit that I'm wrong. I am a perfectionist, and I tend to be very nervous and ups and I get upset when I know I've done something wrong. And this one specific example I have is when I ended up getting one of my physics tests back, and me and my physics teacher had a good, have a decent enough, um, had a good, a close enough, um, you can say relationship, okay. it's okay. A close enough relationship where it's like I would feel comfortable talking to her. And I realized that as we were going over the... Now, I didn't get a perfect grade, um, but when we were going over um, the, um, the test or quiz, I don't entirely remember what it was, I ended up seeing that she ended up grading one of my answers correct when it wasn't. And it took me a lot to go up and say that she ended up grading it wrong. I ended up even breaking down at one point because I just hate, I hate knowing when I'm wrong. And yeah, it, it really hurt to go up there, but I knew it was the right thing to do and that I'd only improve um, from it later. So I ended up going up and she was very grateful that I was so honest and um, she ended up not taking off that many points because most of it I was correct. I was just wrong with the numbers. So, yeah, I, what are numbers in <laughs> physics, anyway, right? So yeah, as an example of me admitting when I'm wrong, I don't really like to, but I will if I feel it's necessary. Now, I have two specific examples with two different relationships that I've kind of already discussed. One is my relationship with my friend Lindsay, and. This was technically the last major argument we ended up having, where beforehand, when I was really emotionally unstable, we would definitely have a lot of falling outs. And this one particular one, I um, was emotionally un... I wasn't able to control my emotions, caused us to fight, and then we didn't talk um, for the rest of the day until the end. And... At recess, I ended up talking with my other friend, Mariah, and I realized what I did was wrong and it was really affecting me. And instead of just going up to Lindsay and apologizing, um, during art class, I ended up making a little bookmark for her. And um, when we were, ended up going back to aftercare, I ended up giving it to her as an apology, and we ended up uh, going back to being friends. Oh, so you bribed her. Hey, that works sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and then my other example was with mommy. Um, whenever I would have, I tend to get moody. Um, you never. At certain points, and occasionally that can definitely show off to mommy, especially when it's like, oh, I need you to do this, I need you to do, just her telling me, asking me to do a favor or something. And most of the time, I'm totally fine with it. 
But when I'm not in a good mood, I'm normally like, yeah, yeah, whatever, sure. Yes, you are. And, like, I know that hurts her, and, like, eventually, and, like, I know she pushes about it, and then I just say, just leave me alone, please. And then I spend um, the rest of the time kind of alone. I reflect on what I said, and eventually I go to her and I apologize, saying I don't know what came over me. I genuinely am sorry that I was uh, that I was being moody to you. Um, I'm in a better place now, and I want to let you know that I didn't actually mean anything that I said. Okay. I, I think they are very good examples, and I think they're kind of characteristic to how a lot of people are. It's when you have to do a lot of these apologies, it's usually a spur-of-the-moment thing. You're emotionally charged. Something bothered you. Uh, you know, you may have had a bad day at school or a bad day at the office, and you just kind of need to unwind or something like that. It's usually not when you're maliciously bad. Yeah. You know, you usually don't do things out of malice. Um, and, you know, we all get moody eventually. That's why Daddy tries to keep chocolate. In the yeah, thanks. What else do we have? Uh, next up, we have do's and don'ts for better teen and parent communication. This also comes to us from aces.edu. So we only really have three major don'ts, which are don't talk down to your teen, don't be judgmental and critical of your teen, and don't refuse to listen to your teen's point of view. Don't spit in the wind, don't tug on Superman's cape. Don't feed the gremlins, <laughs> don't water the gremlins after midnight. Don't, don't feed them after midnight and don't, put, don't, water, don't water them, them. right? Yeah, that's right yeah, there. I think so. Um, and then for the do's, we have make it clear that you are ready and willing to listen. I really care about what you think. Your ideas are important to me. And tell me how, how you see it. Let your teen know that you are working to understand their perspective. What I'm understanding you're trying to say is, so what is really important, what really is important to you is, after saying what you heard your teen say, ask if you got it right. Express your willingness to work together with your teen to arrive at a decision. You might say something like, let each of us offer some ideas on how to deal with this. Or how would you do it? Or what do you think should happen? Take time to connect with your teen every day, a meal together like we do, mm -hmm. a few minutes together each evening before going to bed like you and mommy have TV time, especially in the summertime with Big Brother. Yep. Uh, longer periods of time together on the weekend, which, you know, we spend so much time on the weekend, we're practically climbing the walls to get away from each other. <laughs> <laughs> Find activities that you enjoy doing together. Sometimes teens find it difficult to share what's on their minds during face-to-face -face conversations. Doing an, active, an activity together, such as playing games on the computer, preparing a meal, working on a hobby, or traveling around town can make conversation flow much more easy. Teens will say more when they feel relaxed, and I think that's kind of the, the point with everybody. Everyone's going to be a little more communicative when they're relaxed. Um, you should also permit your teens some privacy. Teens need time to themselves and the, and the right to not share everything with their parents. They would be more willing to share the important things with you if they feel respected by you. Permitting independence from you is a great way to show a teen respect. And finally, you should, you should allow your teen to have opinions that differ from yours. The freedom for teens to have their own ideas and views helps them to become emotionally mature as they move toward adulthood and, think, and need to think on their own. So one of the things that you and I do, which really is a form of communication exercise, and that's our little debates. You know, we'll each kind of fall on the different sides of a topic and discuss it. And in doing so... It's not really about the topic that we're talking about. It's that exercise of communicating. You know, we have different points of view, and I love the fact that we have different points of view. I would never want you to go through life as a clone copy of me, thinking the same thing, doing the same thing. Every time you have a different opinion than I do, that means that you're unique. That's you, and you're defining yourself, and I think it's awesome. 
And when we have those discussions, it really helps to stimulate those communication skills. How do you get your point across to somebody? Now, you're doing it. When we do it, we do it on the level of equals. I don't, I don't have that discussion with you, you know, on the level of I'm an adult, you're a teenager. And it gives you that opportunity to interact at an adult level, you know, trying to form an argument, trying to form, put together logic and, and interject facts and then counter what the argument is from the other side. And we do it as a discussion, but we really do it kind of as a, as a play exercise. Yeah, and most of the time the topics technically aren't even that big. Like, how do you refer, like, the one topic we had recently was somebody who shaves off their, well, somebody like, like you're, you're technically bald. Right. Like, but what happens when you shave off other parts of your body? What's that called? Right. And like, we had a, well, we had a debate about a cat who, sh who, you know, you shave all the hair off the cat, the cat's naked. Yeah. It's not bald. And it's, but it's hairless. It's, it's a hair, that's it's what it was. It was hairless. Yeah. It's a hairless cat, but it's not bald. Right. So and I shave my head, so I'm bald, but clearly I'm not hairless. Yeah, and then there's the bald eagle, which technically isn't a bald eagle. It just looks bald. Exactly. And it's, it's silly things like that sometimes, but sometimes we have more serious questions. Sometimes, you know, today at dinner we were talking about historical stuff. You know, we were, you're, the book that you're reading for school is, a, is a, basically a history book, and I'm reading it too so that, so that we can have those conversations. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to improve your communication skills. Having a podcast. Having a podcast has done wonders for your communication skills. Yep. You go back and look at our first 10 episodes, and it's a completely, literally a completely different show than what we have now. Yeah, like I was very unwilling to talk unless I was spoken to or asked questions. You had to constantly ask me questions. I had to ask direct questions to you to get you to answer them in more than just a couple of words. Yeah. <laughs> it was agonizing. Yep, I can imagine. So, and again, and this is all stuff that parents can do with their kids. Get to know, and it helps you to get to know your kids, but get to know your kids. Have conversations with them. Don't treat them like they're, they're teenagers because they might be in a teenage body, but they, they need to exercise their adult mind sometimes and talk about bigger topics. Yeah. We talk about politics all the time. Usually it's a frustrating, agonizing discussion <laughs> with the way politics are today. But you have to have those kinds of conversations. Treat your child, treat your teenager, I'll say, not your child, treat your teenager on an adult level when it comes to communications. Because that's how they're going to get their practice. It's at home first, and it's going to empower them moving forward. Yeah. We're going to take our last break and come back and get your closing thoughts. All righty. Go for your closing thoughts. All right. So to everyone out there, I just wanted to say that no matter what relationship you have, communication is key, really. Like, one of the biggest reasons that relationships either succeed or fail is due to either the la the act or lack of communication and especially when it comes to teenagers and parents that's an area where it's been commonplace where communication isn't always good or it needs to be improved like how teenagers are rebellious against their parents because of the lack of communication. But as me and my dad have shown, you can have a good good communication with your teens if you're treated on the same level and you also apply the communication skills we talked about in our podcast. So really the important message is just to have some form of communication in really any relationship you have and just really find better ways to have it well said sage knowledge as always i uh, thank you <laughs> <laughs> that's it for today before we do go i would want to once again encourage you to subscribe to the podcast if you don't already do so you can find this podcast audio versions listed as insights in the teens you can find audio and video versions of all of our podcasts listed as insights into things or available on Apple Podcasts, 
Pandora, Castro, Stitcher, Podbean, anywhere you get a podcast. I would also invite you to write in, give us your feedback, tell us how we're doing, give us your show suggestions. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can find high-res versions of all of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. We do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. Uh, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast or links to all that and much more on our official website at insights into things.com and you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights into Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother, Sam. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.